tune to the Empowering Women podcast. Together, we will hear from ambitious and inspiring career women as they share their stories of success and overcoming career challenges. And now, your host, Mel the Engineer. Welcome to episode four of the Empowering Women podcast. I'm so glad you were able to join us for this episode. On this podcast, we showcase women leaders from a variety of industries. Our hope is that through these interviews, we can inspire the next generation of leaders like you. Our guest today, Kristen Wood, is extremely passionate about cleaning and protecting water. One really unique thing about Kristen is that she works in a trade space. So as a wastewater treatment operator, she is in a very small minority of women. In the numbers I found, women make up only 5% of water and wastewater treatment plant operators. As a leader in this space, Kristen is definitely one of a few trailblazers. She's got some great insights about approaching leadership, and one of her thoughts, which she shares towards the end of our talk, is related to Bill Nye, and it was so compelling that I wrote a LinkedIn article about her insights, so I'll include a link to that in the show notes. All right, let's go through Kristen's bio, and we'll jump right into the interview. Kristen Wood is currently the Operations Administrator at the County of Summit Department of Sanitary Sewer Services. She has over 10 years of experience in the wastewater field. She started her career at the city of Ashtabula Wastewater Laboratory, then worked in both laboratory and operations roles for the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. Kristen holds a Master of Business Administration and a Bachelor of Science from the University of Finlay. She currently holds certifications as a professional operator, wastewater treatment class four, class three wastewater operator and class two wastewater analyst. She is passionate about sharing the excitement of clean water with the world. Let's welcome Kristen. Welcome Kristen to the Empowering Women podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. I'm really excited to be a part of this. I want to start by just getting an intro from you. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Um, So I am a wastewater nerd, and this is an accidental career path for me. Uh, I went to school for a pre-veterinary medicine degree and a master of business administration. And I kind of accidentally got into a wastewater career working in a laboratory and Then I accidentally went from the laboratory to operations. And when I got into wastewater operations, I found my true calling in life. So I am incredibly embarrassingly passionate about wastewater and wastewater operations in particular. And so because of that, I've gotten to be involved in some really great opportunities. I've taken three operations challenge teams Uh, Two of them we went all the way to nationals with, including last year's Insane in the Force Main team, which took third place in the process control event. Uh, That's a great name. Yes, (laughs) that was actually a Twitter poll winner. And I love outreach to the public, and I love outreach to people within my industry, because a lot of times people are afraid to share what wastewater is, what it's about, Uh, the benefits of it. And I love just blowing that wide open and showing, you know, wastewater operators how important they are and showing the public how important wastewater operators are. So I guess guess that's uh, as good of a bio as uh, you're going to get. I love wastewater. Excellent. That's awesome. Okay. So you gave us a lot of juicy info there. And I definitely want to come back to the operations challenge teams and the competitions and also the outreach part. But before we do that, you mentioned these sort of happy accidents that took you down this path. And I want to explore that a little more. Could you talk to us about the first 
the first accident and is is this the one that's connected to brain drain in your local paper <laughs> yes so um after i had graduated from college with a uh, pre-veterinary medicine degree i thought that i would get a job at that point and the only person that would hire me was my dad selling office supplies which Thank you, Dad. I really appreciated the income, but it really had nothing to do with what I wanted to be doing for a career. And uh, while I was working that job, there was a newspaper series published in our local newspaper about what they were calling the brain drain, which was a disconnect between companies that needed good college educated people to fill their workforce and people going to college unable to find good career level jobs and how could both of those things be true at the same time. And so I wrote to the editor and I said, thank you so much for writing this. This is my life. Um, And he wrote back and asked if he could take my picture for the local newspaper for a subsequent article he was writing. And I agreed. So There's a picture of me on Main Street with my accounting and biology books and uh, the wastewater treatment plant. The superintendent came in to buy uh, pens the next day and paper, you know, really vital office supplies. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And they said, we need somebody like you. We need you to come apply today. They doubled my salary on the spot. And uh, so me being open to a really weird off the wall opportunity. I'd never heard of wastewater. I had no idea what I would be doing, but they were paying for it. So I was really excited about that. And as I got into the field, um, I had a really, really great mentor. And I love anytime somebody gets somebody like that off the bat. His name was Kim Nordquist and he was the chemist in the lab I was working. I remember my first day there I made a mistake and I threw away some reagents that we weren't supposed to throw away. And he caught me and I thought for sure that was it. Now I'm fired. I have to go back. And he goes, oh, no, that's just a cost of doing business. It's going to be okay, and you're not going to do it tomorrow. And between that, you know, ability to make mistakes and learn within the career path and the fact that I was getting to use all of these science Um, based things that I had been learning about in a book for years. I loved biology. I loved chemistry. I loved physics. And getting to see where all of those theories actually, you know, hit the real world. You have the physics of how fast the wastewater is flowing. You have the biology of how do you keep the correct microorganisms alive? How do you feed them? You have the chemistry of which chemicals do you use and how much and when. And goodness, I just, I, I fell in love with it as a career path and not necessarily a job. And it was the first time I ever felt like that. And I, uh, I haven't really looked back ever since. That's awesome. So tell us a little bit more about the responsibilities that you had there at the lab and what led to the next change or the, the accident that brought you into operations. So, um, my first laboratory gig uh, was at the city of Ashtabula. They have um, an average flow of three or so million gallons per day, which is relatively small. And so working there, there wasn't a huge staff. So I got to be involved in so much. The sampling, we were doing analysis from from the easy to the difficult, the high level chemistries. Like I said, working under Kim, who was a chemist, Uh, He maybe bordered a little on mad scientist and I loved it. We would do experimentation on different chemical feed rates and stuff like that. It was just really, really cool and engaging. So I knew that this was a career path and I had worked with um, one of the operators at that facility had worked for the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District many, many years before. And he said, you know, if you have a 10 year plan, make the 10 year plan involve going to a big facility like that. So the opportunity came up to work in the lab at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, and I took it. And after being in the lab for about a year, I realized I had made a big mistake. And that's nothing to say bad about the, uh, the sewer district's lab, 
But what it was, was it's a much more specialized lab. So what I was doing was the E. coli analysis and bioassays. And that was it. I was doing a lot of them. I was doing them at a very high level, but that was it. I lost all contact with the bigger picture of a plant and why we were doing the things that we were doing. So one of the people that I was working with in the lab left to go to operations. And I thought he was crazy for leaving, but he called me and said, you need to get down here because it's really neat. I think you will fit in well. And I just took the absolutely crazy jump from something I knew, which was the lab, to something I had no idea about, which was operations. And uh, turned out he was absolutely right. I have the mind of an operator. I like to classify people based on their wastewater job, which is a little embarrassing when they have nothing to do with wastewater. (laughs) But when you think about like an engineer is usually looking ahead and they're planning and they're thinking and they're, they're putting complex problems together on paper. And a mechanic has got their hands, you know, in the pump and they are, they know exactly which piece causes which thing to happen. And what an operator is, is someone that comes in and knows just enough to be dangerous about everybody else's job and figures out how to connect all of those pieces to make it work. So I may not, necessarily be fixing a pump, but I understand why that pump needs to run, how long it needs to run, and when it needs to run. And I have just been in love with operations in wastewater treatment plants ever since. I love seeing the big picture, pulling all the pieces together, figuring out what's wrong, coming up with creative solutions to fix it. It's the kind of person I am. So I just got really, really lucky that my career path took me someplace where I can use those skills and the things that I'm good at um, in a very useful and, um, quite frankly, lucrative kind of way. You're listening to the Empowering Women Podcast. I'd like to go backwards for a moment. For our listeners who are not in the water and wastewater space, could you explain the lab work that you mentioned where you're looking at E. coli and bioassays? What is the significance of that within the context of wastewater? Sure. So with wastewater, you you have the end goal design is to make water that came from someone's toilet or from the street, uh, depending on the situation. Um, You take that water, you put it through these scientific processes, you can chemical, biological, um, or physical treatment process. And at the end of all of this work, you have a product that is clean and safe for uh, the people that would be potentially swimming or boating in the waterway. And Additionally, you have to protect the environment as a whole. So the difference in my mind between water and wastewater, when the water company puts water to your house, they have to make sure it is absolutely safe for you. And so they put uh, chemicals in it to make sure that you are completely safe from all bacteria that could be getting to you. In wastewater, we can't really do that because we don't want to kill the bacteria. The bacteria are a necessary part of the ecosystem. So we want to kill the bad bacteria without killing the good bacteria. And it is a very fine line in the Goldilocks zone. So one of the things that we look at specifically is the E. coli analysis, which is a sample from the water that would be going out to the river or lake or stream. And we analyze this strand of E. coli as a indicator. So we don't necessarily believe that the E. coli that we're measuring could hurt someone, but it does indicate how clean or dirty the water is. There are lots of tests that we do that are very specific for things like that. E. coli is one of the tests. We test for phosphorus. We test for nitrogen, the amount of carbon in the water. All of these tests look for specific things. The other, the big flip side for a bioassay test is that it is not specific. It is 
very literally, you take the water sample that's going into the river and you put organisms in it and see if they're able to live and breed. And they either do or they don't. So it's very stressful test because any tiny thing can impact. Um, well, there's two sides. One is a reproduction test on water fleas, which are the cutest little darn things. Um, <laughs> water fleas will reproduce in about three to four days. They'll start creating broods of anywhere from five to 20 little babies. So part of my job was to literally count the tiny fleas in a cup over and over and over again. Um, and the other is a fish test that examines how big the fish get given a very specific amount of food. So when you look at that statistically, you're able to figure out if organisms in the environment are really and truly able to survive and thrive in the water that you're putting in the environment. So they are really, really great tests and I'm glad we have them. I just needed a little bit more variety in my personal uh, career path. Absolutely. So tell us what is at the heart of your love and passion for your career in operations? So I think the thing that really gets me excited is the ability to problem solve. Um, especially, I like to say in the world of uh, essay exams and multiple choice exams, I'm a multiple choice. I like when there's the right answer, a wrong answer. I like for it to be cut and dry like that. And a lot of times in wastewater operations, it's absolutely true. You don't necessarily know what is causing the problem, but it's very cut and dry whether you have a problem or not. Are you producing a high quality water that's acceptable to the environment or aren't you? And if you're not, what can you do to change it? And that, that kind of cut and dry, this is a problem, I can fix it mentality. I love that. And with it, you get a real sense that you are being useful to the world. I love that when I take my son to the lake, uh, we live up by Lake Erie. I take him to the lake and I go, I made that. I love that moment of sharing that, that something truly great happened because of what I did. Yeah, that's a really powerful message. You mentioned that you're also really passionate about the outreach side. And I'd like to say for our listeners who aren't in this space that the municipality you work for, the uh, Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District, is really out there in terms of being ahead on outreach, in my opinion. I mean, I think they're very active and they do a great job. So Tell us a little bit more about that. What part of outreach is important to you? And tell us what you think the Regional Sewer District does a good job of. Sure. Let me start by saying that as of October, I'm actually no longer with the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. I love them and still love communicating with them. Um, but I am currently working at Summit County Department of Sanitary Sewer Services which does not necessarily have the kind of outreach that the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has, which I think is a real opportunity for us to model what the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District has done. What they've done is they have done outreach where people actually are. Uh, instead of, you know, the things that are important to wastewater people, they're worried about the things that are important to people and then kind of sneaking in the education about wastewater along the way. So, for example, they had award-winning tweets during the NBA finals when Cleveland Cavaliers were there because it was Cleveland and it was relatable and they would use all kinds of ways to get people pulled in using the hype around the Cavs and then sneak in things about, you know, LeBron James throne, and then it would be a picture of a toilet. So they, they did a really good job of, you know, making themselves relevant to the people that, that needed to hear the message that didn't know that they needed to hear the message. And I absolutely love that about their paradigm. They've also done a lot of work in promoting 
frontline employees, which I think is really important, uh, not only for the community, but for your frontline employees, because um, your community needs to recognize that there are frontline employees that are genuinely have a shovel in the, the mess that you have sent down that pipe and that they are happy to do that job because it makes a difference in their lives. And to be recognized for that uh, is something that our industry hasn't historically done. You know, the doctors of the world are, are very uh, celebrated as they should be. But quite frankly, wastewater operators save more lives each year than doctors do by protecting the waters that people are drinking and fishing and swimming in. So that kind of, you know, bringing the outreach to the people that need to hear it is very important. And I'm just really passionate about making sure that it happens because if we don't have that, there's a very real risk that wastewater kind of slides in the background. Everything, not everything, but most things that we have are underground. You know, people see roads and bridges and think of infrastructure. They don't think about the water and wastewater pipes that are running underground and may have been there for hundreds of years. And worse yet, we're facing this huge uh, need for infrastructure on our end because the Clean Water Act uh, which was in the 70s, a lot of the equipment that was put in the ground uh, or in the plants for that reason is starting to reach its expected life span. So convincing people that it's worth it to spend the money to upgrade these systems to continue to clean the water is sometimes hard if they don't recognize that that service is being provided in the first place. They start to take for granted that water is clean and then they're maybe not so willing to pay for something that's, of course, it's there. You know, why wouldn't it be there? It's always been there. So public outreach does that for you. Absolutely. I think it's an important uh, aspect of reaching the, the rate payers and helping them understand the value that's being brought. So, I, you know, wastewater and drinking water, those services are much like... Our solid waste disposal, you know, people might not think about landfills very often because it's not something they see every day and they don't see uh, the pipes and pumps and pump and lift stations that make all of this possible. Right. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I apologize. I didn't realize that that you had moved on. That's my fault. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's very recent. <laughs> so... so Oh, I guess there's a question there. You recently moved on to this new position. Did you take it in order to have more responsibility or what, what was the move there about? Yeah. So uh, the main driver behind changing positions was to have the opportunity to grow. Um, I went from a um, subject matter expert position at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District up to essentially a superintendent level. So it was a promotion and I get to learn a lot in this new position. I had never actually managed people before. I'd only managed process. I had never been involved in pump stations before, which are the way that water gets to a wastewater treatment plant. So it's, I had always just kind of stopped at the gate of the wastewater treatment plant and called it good. And this new job is challenging me to um, stretch what I know and how to help my communities. It's also getting me a little bit closer to the people. So we get phone calls from the people that live in the community around us, and we get to hear their concerns. And it's been a really, really neat opportunity that I didn't, I didn't realize how many facets there were. Uh, that I hadn't seen before, getting to meet the people that live in the neighborhood and get to know who's walking their dogs and being able to relate to them about why the trucks need to go down the road, uh, even though they are kind of loud. And it's been a really great opportunity for me to, to grow uh, professionally. I'd like to ask a question there about moving into this leadership role. 
What would you say your leadership style is like, and how do you like to lead by example? So I don't think my leadership style necessarily has a definition. If it had, I would be more interested if people would put that maybe in the comments for me so that I can find it. I was very lucky to have several mentors in my career already. Uh, one of them is Catherine Cristani, who is at the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District. And as a side, she would be a great person to interview as well. <laughs> okay. She was the best manager I've ever had. She was the kind of person that would give you a task, a well-defined task. And if you did it, then she celebrated that you were able to accomplish it. And if you didn't, she celebrated the fact that you got to learn and develop in a way that you hadn't expected. And for me, having that support structure of someone that, I don't know, couldn't be disappointed in me was, it was an incredible and life-changing experience for me. And I try every single day to be the same kind of person for the people that are working under me. So um, I try very hard to make sure that they know that mistakes are okay, that they're expected. And if they have them, that they should absolutely share them because that only made us stronger as a company that they were, um, that they discovered something that was a potential cause of failure and we were able to expose it and fix it. And I've seen how much that trust starts to build people up. So when I started in this position, and I haven't been there very long, I noticed that almost everyone there was hesitant about their jobs, that they were kind of waiting to be told what to do. They were waiting for someone to point the way. And when I kind of gave them the freedom to make some decisions about their day, we have a work order system that tracks the things that need to be done. For example, if a pump is broken, we would create a work order that would say this pump was broken on this day and needs repaired. And then that work order is sent to a mechanic to repair it. Um, so they have kind of a bank of tasks that are already assigned to them and just allowing them the ability to pick what they were going to do each day to make their own efficiency, to make their own decisions. And then um, when, when they inevitably would make the wrong call and it would maybe cost us a little bit extra money, the fact that they did not get in trouble for having made a decision, even if it wasn't the right decision, I've seen these, these people already start to blossom under that in that they're just making the decisions that need to be made in the field and they're making good decisions. They're making decisions that balance the environment versus costs, all those things that we genuinely think of as a manager's type job, my frontline workers are starting to develop that, which is going to be great for them because it gives them kind of a little bit of freedom in their job. They get to take some control over that. And it's going to be great for me because that's going to help me with my succession planning. I, I will have a highly trained manager to replace me if I ever move up or on. So I don't necessarily know if that style has a uh, name or not, but empowering my employees maybe would be the closest thing. I think that's a great way to describe it. And as you were talking there uh, at the end, you reminded me of a book that I read recently called Multipliers, and it's about the style or the actions that that leaders can take to ensure their subordinates or their direct reports are growing and and becoming leaders themselves and basically being able to carry out their responsibilities in the most effective way and i just i just love what you were describing because i i feel like you're putting your faith in them and they see that and feel that and then they have the sort of courage and 
courage to not just make mistakes, but to to try and uh, to know that it's going to be okay, even if something goes wrong. Absolutely. Actually, you're talking about the book Multipliers. I haven't read that one in particular, but one of my favorites that's very similar to what you're saying, it's by L. David Marquet, and it's called Turn the Ship Around. L. David Marquet was a Navy captain, and when he was young and coming up through the ranks, somebody believed in him and gave him the permission to make his own decisions, even though it was very rigid military style, he would say, I intend to, as a way to speak to his superiors. So he would say, I intend to turn the ship 30 degrees. And then the the captain would reply, proceed. And by doing it that way, instead of the captain dictating what needed to be done, it was the people that were doing the frontline work dictating what needed to be done, and the captain just checking to make sure everything was fine. So when he became a captain himself, he set to broaden that approach for his entire crew, and he did all kinds of things to serve his crew. So one of the stories in the book is about all the bolts that hold a submarine together. Those bolts need to be scrubbed or replaced constantly. And it is a terrible, horrible job that everybody hates to be doing, but you have to pay your dues by doing it. He decided that he would spend the money to get stainless steel bolts throughout the entire vessel so that nobody would have to do that grunt work because it was demeaning and there was no reason to have to pay your dues when you're all, you could be learning something useful with that time. And that book is really probably one of the guiding principles in my leadership style. That gives me uh, that gives me some pause. That's an interesting philosophy and gosh, what what you described in that story, what it really sounds like is a willingness to respect your employees no matter what level they're at. Exactly. Another thing that I really like to do uh, as far as respecting the people I work with is everybody has that person at the job that they hate. There's always somebody that you don't get along with. One of my favorite games to play with myself and others is to encourage them to find the value in the person that you hate the most. So the person that drives you absolutely crazy, find their value. And I guarantee that you will find it if you open your mind to it, because it may drive you crazy that they are an absolute perfectionist and they can't even stand it if you put the paper clip on the left-hand side instead of the right-hand side. But you know what? That's the person that you want going over your report before you submit it to the council because they will find everything. So I love challenging others and myself. I'm certainly not exempt from this. I There are plenty of colleagues that I have not gotten along with. Um, But I really think it's important to find the value and worth of everyone that you work with, regardless of your own personal style. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. All right. I'm going to switch gears a little bit here with you. Could you speak to us about the ratio of men to women in treatment operations? What does that look like? (laughs) Um. It's barely a ratio. Um, There are (laughs) women in the industry, but there are not many. I'm struggling really hard to to think of more than two or three that I personally know. I know that they're out there. They're making a, a good commitment to it. I think there are a lot of, I don't think they're intentional barriers, but I think they're accidental barriers 
to the position. First of all, the visibility is a problem across, you know, both men and women. People don't go through high school dreaming of being a wastewater operator uh, on any front. But additionally, there's things like operations is a 24-7 job. So the, the water has to be treated in the morning, in the middle of the night, in the middle of the day, weekends, holidays. When I first started in operations, I missed uh, the first five Christmases that my son ever had. I had to give that up to the industry to be able to, to move up. And I was willing to do that because I could see an end goal that I wasn't going to be in that spot forever doing the shift work. But I can see how that would filter people out, that they would look at that and say, that's not worth it to me. Even though they might be the most engaged, thoughtful, most promising prospect that the field has ever known, we might unintentionally sift people out for reasons like that. It's, it's also a stinky job. One really good thing that I had happen to me in college while I was in the pre-veterinary medicine course, I had an anatomy professor and we were learning about your nose, the olfactory system. And she, she stared right at the class and she said, I need to tell you this, this is important, pay attention. If you have to choose between a loud job and a stinky job, choose the stinky job, and here's why. And she proceeded to tell us that your ears will physically hear every sound coming in. So if somebody is using a jackhammer outside of your house, you will hear every single time it strikes. For your nose, however, it will only detect changes. So, for example, if you walk into your house at the end of the day, you might notice that your house smells like your house. Or if you walk into a barn, it smells like a barn. But after you've been there for 10 minutes or so, you're not noticing those smells. And that's a, a physical difference between the ears and the nose. So, thankfully, this professor told me that. And it had always been kind of bouncing around in my mind because we were next probably talking about cow manure at the time as opposed to wastewater, but it's really not that different. So if I go on vacation, my job is very smelly as I walk in the door. But day to day, I don't notice because it, it's where I live. It's what I do. But that can be, if you didn't get that guidance, that can be terrifying walking in and thinking I could never possibly work in an environment that smelled like that. So I guess part of the problem of our industry is that we don't have enough women. We also don't have a lot of minorities. Where, where I'm currently working, there is almost, I was the diversity program walking in the door. I've already started changing some of the hiring practices to try to recruit from outside that group. But it's a very real problem with our industry. And I guess... I can kind of speak to this through the operations challenge, which we've already kind of mentioned. I have found when I was building my operations challenge teams that the best people were from really different backgrounds. So having someone that's in management and someone that's in a union and someone that's black and someone that's a woman and someone with sales experience and someone who used to work at Olive Garden, when you get people from all those different backgrounds coming together against a single problem, you will find the right answer. Now, if you have a group of people that are completely homogenous, all from very similar backgrounds, they may look at the problem the exact same way and just beat their heads against the wall trying to figure it out. Um, it happens all the time with me and my kids where I am just unable to solve some kind of problem with a kitchen appliance and my son will just walk up and fix it because he's not looking at the problem the same way I am. Uh, he may not even recognize that it was a problem and he's fixed it. So I love being able to build teams that have that diversity in it. Even though it doesn't necessarily currently exist, I think it's where the field will be going or needs to be going um, and actively pursuing those kinds of things when doing hiring decisions and things like that. 
So when you speak to these different groups, what would you highlight that's awesome about this career path that you would want them to know? So my favorite thing to do with high school students especially is I will be very brutally honest about how much money I make. And I love seeing the look on the kids' faces when they realize that $8 an hour is not the only future available to them, that they could get involved in a real genuine career with benefits just by getting involved in our industry. And I really, I kind of use that as the gateway to bring people in and make them look a second time. I also really like explaining why we do things, especially if you've never toured a wastewater treatment plant, please do. It is just a fascinating piece of industrial revolution amazement. When you think about it, society as we know it wouldn't exist without these things. There would just be sewage running down the gutters into your front lawns. And when you get into these plants, they have the science is right there in front of you. You can see it. It's like a, a science experiment in real time. You can see how the velocity can change. If you, if you slow down the velocity or you speed up the velocity of the water, you can see the changes. Um, when you get into an aeration tank, you can pull up a sample of those microorganisms and you can look at them and you can compare them from a good tank to a bad tank to one that treats uh, carbon to one that treats for nitrogen. And you can see it. it. It's just fascinating to me. And quite frankly, it's fascinating to a lot of kids, too. Because for them, sometimes science has always been on the page. It's always been, you know, a math problem to solve. Well, it's a math problem to solve, but it's a math problem to solve in the real world. Come look. Come see what happens if you change the amount of microorganisms you have in the tank. Come see what that number means. And so once you've kind of gotten them in to see that, most of the people that you want to be attracting anyway are already in. They are already excited and ready to be involved in the industry. The hard part is getting them to the gates in the first place. Um, and that's a really hard problem, I guess, that I haven't necessarily solved, I guess. You spoke about this a little bit, and I'd, I'd like to, to hear some uh, a little bit more. You mentioned that you missed Christmas with your family for several years, but that it was worth it to you. Could you, would you mind sharing with us a little bit about your personal life and how your career intersects? I hate to say work-life balance, but basically how, how does this career path mesh with your personal life? The industry as it is is pretty tough. There's a lot of deeply entrenched feelings about the dues that you have to pay to get to where you need to be. I don't necessarily think that that's specific to our industry, but it is really prevalent. I was lucky that I had the support of my family uh, during my swing shift days, but they weren't they weren't uh, family friendly. I won't lie about that. It gave me some opportunity to do really great projects around the house when my kids were in school and I had an off day. It was fabulous for grocery shopping at 2 a.m. because let me tell you what, you can read every single label in the store and nobody will run their cart into you at 2 a.m. Fabulous. But other than that, it, there, is, there is a trade-off. You're, you're at work on Christmas Eve thinking about how you're barely going to be coherent on Christmas morning because you're going to be getting off work at 7 a.m. and you'll have been working for 12 hours. The, the flip side of that is I think when you have a situation like that, you also really develop the camaraderie in the workplace because you're, you're there on Christmas Eve, but so are these other people. And you end up, you know, talking about what your family traditions are. And you, you build this real, very tight-knit team of people that are going through this 
um, similar suffering at a similar time as you. Um, and so sometimes I, I look back on, on my swing shift time, it's kind of a bittersweet. Like I, I was never part of a team as much as I was during those times because we were so tight knit. But also, I mean, those Christmases were important too. So that, that's, that's a really hard, it's a really hard problem to get around. I will say that I personally try to make that not a problem for the people working for me. And I hope that that trend continues at large. Um, I have, I have lots of people that feel that they're expected to work late every day and prove themselves by, by working beyond when they're supposed to. And they, they're genuinely surprised when I tell them that it's okay to wait till tomorrow to go home, to be with their families. Um, and I, I can't even say that that's necessarily working yet because they still don't believe me. They, I think they still think that I'm joking and they have to keep working harder to prove that they're going to work, even though I told them not to work. Um, but I think it's really important. The, the research supports having time away from work to improve the work. If you are able to go on vacation, when you come back, you're going to get more done than if you had stayed, stayed at work during that vacation or, or donated that vacation time back. And I think probably our, our interconnected society is really bad at letting go of work for a little bit, to put the work cell phone away, to put the, the at-home SCADA networks down and genuinely engage in something other than work. But I think that's going to be something that is going to be a challenge for the industry for a long time. And I don't necessarily see any industry leaders pitching ideas for how to fix that. You're listening to the Empowering Women podcast with Mel the Engineer. Today, we are hearing about leadership in the water space from Kristen Wood, a wastewater treatment plant operator and manager. You can listen again and share the Empowering Women podcast from iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or TuneIn. Thank you so much for listening. to the operations challenge uh, competitions a little bit could could yeah, you just yeah could you just describe those for us and and why you feel they're important all right so operations challenge is an event that's put on for teams of wastewater professionals to prove that they are the best in the industry it's uh, teams of four that compete in five different events. Those events are collections, which is the pipes and the pump stations coming into the plants. There's process control, which is the math and the theory behind the the science. There's safety, which is kind of usually centered around people that would have to go in and out of a manhole. There is uh, a maintenance event, which involves kind of pump mechanics and how to troubleshoot and repair. And then there's a laboratory event, which shows your ability to perform a thorough analysis. And here's the catch for all of them. You're on the clock. So all of these events, you are trying to be the fastest. But if you make a mistake, it's going to cost you a time penalty. So not only do you have to be fast, you have to be fast and accurate. And the amazing thing about this competition is, first of all, you have something to fight against. You're fighting against the clock. And people that fight against something together form teams that are much stronger and able to tackle complex tasks than teams that are just thrown together to kind of come up with a solution to a problem that's not really that bad. Second of all, you're really honing the talent of the people that are on that team 
and you're developing their leadership qualities at the exact same time. It's this, this crazy mixing pot of being able to develop someone and it's already written out for you. You don't have to develop this plan. It's already out there. There's a standard operating procedure for each of the events and how to do them. You don't have to make it up. You just have to try to do it better than everybody else. So one of the big benefits for this is the cross training that would happen. So your, your mechanic is probably going to be great on your maintenance event, but he also has to be great on your lab event. He has to be great on your process control event. He has to be great on your safety event. And the same thing with someone that comes from a lab background. Sure, they're going to be a rock star at the lab event, but how well can they pull a pump apart? How well are they at finding the bearings? Because of that, the leadership qualities develop naturally because that mechanic is going to take control over that event and help show your lab person where the bearings are. What do they look like? I know for me, that was, that was really hard. When I came into it the first time, I knew nothing about pump maintenance. I had, to, I had to look at the mechanic on the team and I said, okay, my first job is to grease the bearing. What does a bearing look like? Um, and so he got to develop his leadership style by being able to teach what he knew and show the whole team. Conversely, when it was time for the lab event, that was something that I was comfortable in and I could show the others how to do that part. One of the other great, unexpected, wonderful things that happened when I had an operations challenge team is that cross training made the employees better in their current job, even if it didn't look like it made sense. So one of my first teammates was an electrical instrumentation technician, which meant that he was responsible for performing calibrations on the equipment that would measure things like the amount of oxygen in the water or the pH. And one of his calibrations was for a a chemical called sodium bisulfite, which we use to counter any chlorine that's added to the water. And you have to keep that within very tight bands. And it's a very very long calibration. It takes about two hours normally to do a calibration. He found that after competing in the laboratory event where you're forced to have a graduated cylinder and a meniscus and mixing chemicals in the right quantity, his calibrations were taking a third less time than anybody else because he was nailing the meniscus every single time and he wasn't having to redo that calibration every day. We also found that getting our teammates exposed to the competition itself meant that they were networking on a much higher level than they normally would be exposed to. So when I went to my very first WEF Tech in 2016, it blew my mind. This is a big, giant event where there are miles upon miles of people selling pumps and people selling pipes and people selling everything you can imagine and wastewater. And the people that are there are industry leaders. These are the the superintendents. These are the directors, things like that. To have an operator and a mechanic and an instrument tech on the floor of WEFTEC intermingling with the people that were the superintendents and the directors of the world was absolutely huge to all of us. And everyone that I have taken on an operations challenge team We've actually had to work really hard to retain them because they become so qualified. They become so skilled and they have such a great network that they're really hard to hang on to. And uh, that for me is, is probably the greatest uh, compliment that I as a manager can get is that I was able to train so, someone so well that they are the best in the industry and other people want them. Those are the kinds of people that I want working for me. That was such a great plug for WEFTEC. <laughs> so for our listeners who don't know, Wef- WEFTEC is, uh, like you mentioned, it's it's probably the largest wastewater conference in North America, certainly. And it gets, uh, these days, over 20,000 professionals attending each year. So it's a big deal. Have you encountered any obstacles as a woman in this space? whether overt or something more like an unconscious bias, and how did you overcome 
that instance. I think I've seen a lot more of the unconscious than the overt, but there are definitely times that I have, I have been challenged to keep my cool <laughs> in the workplace because of my gender. I think that there is sometimes, maybe it's being overly nice, but a lot of times I was offended because people would think I couldn't do the physical sides of my job. Like they would push me out of the way to open my valves for me, which I think was them being very, very nice. But at the time it really felt insulting that like, you think that I really can't open that valve myself. I'm just the same as you. I've also seen a lot of women have trouble with communication styles because there's kind of, I want to say a stereotype for a men's communication style is usually much more direct. They want to say, I think your hair looks dumb today. And then they move on with their lives. And women usually are, are much more careful about things like that, where they would say, wow, interesting new hairstyle instead. And that I think for a lot of women, when they come into the workplace and someone walks up to them and says, your hair looks dumb, I, they're put off by that. I am either lucky or unlucky in that my uh, mom kind of raised me in the more manly communication style. And it took me a long time to figure that out because I knew that I was having trouble communicating in my workplace for a while, but I kept going to these classes and they kept telling me to be more direct, be more direct, be more out there. And I would do that and it would just get worse. Well, it turns out I needed to take the how to communicate with women class and I needed to watch what I was saying and be a little less direct than I naturally was. So for me, I was kind of lucky that I was able to to slide into that space and was completely comfortable with the kind of communication style that I was in. One example that I love is I was pregnant in at as an operator and someone came up to me in the middle of the road in the middle of the day and said, oh my gosh, are you pregnant? Which is something you don't do. And... <laughs> I, I said yes, uh, stunned that I would I'd be asked this question. Um, but I realized as I was walking away that, you know, for him, if the answer would have been yes, he would have said congratulations. And if the answer would have been no, he would have been like, me too, I have a belly just like you. <laughs> um, so luckily for me, I fit into that well. But I think for a lot of women, that can be... Uh, a culture shock if, they, if they're not necessarily prepared for that. Well, I think there's something to be said for taking taking the time to learn about different communication styles regardless of gender and then being able to apply that to your day-to-day -day interactions with a calm mind so you know being able to interact with someone and recognize hey they don't communicate the way that I do this is their style and this is how I can adapt to you know work better with them uh, you know, like it or not, the people around us are are not always going to be aware, perhaps, of how they're coming across. And so if we want to be leaders and sort of s step up into those roles, I think I think that's an important point that, that you're making here is that we we can learn about how other people communicate so that we can better interact and facilitate the work outcomes that we want. That's absolutely true. Another book plug, the, the book that I read that made the most difference in my career, it's called Crucial Conversations. And this book, it talks about exactly what you're saying. 
kind of taking a conversation and breaking it down into a study of the other person. So, you know, instead of being defensive and wondering, you know, why are they coming at me in an angry way? You go, well, that is very interesting behavior from this human. Allow me to inspect this and experiment with it and see what happens if, and maybe I can try to get ahead of the problem. And for me, that was, maybe it's obvious to a lot of people, but that was a huge change for me in my life in recognizing that emotions are okay and they should be in the workplace. We shouldn't try to, to whitewash out any emotion in the workplace, but my own personal emotions could be kind of redirected to helping others instead of uh, kind of escalating when somebody was angry, getting angry back, that kind of a situation to be able to, to break out of that. And that kind of a skill in the workplace makes all the difference. Absolutely. And dear listeners, I know we've mentioned several books on this episode, so I will be sure to put those titles and authors in the show notes so you don't have to memorize those as you're listening. Okay, so I want to bring up now that most of our listeners may not know that you are also a talented musician. (laughs) So I would love to hear about how do you come up with these great songs that you perform at WEFTEC? So my uh, online persona is called The Stewer Chick at S-W-E-R underscore C-H-I-C. And I was challenged by one of my Twitter followers to compete in a contest <laughs> to write the, the, or the fight song for our overarching organization, which is the Water Environment Federation. So they had a contest and I kind of was just playing around with ideas. Um, And I never really meant to write a rap. It was kind of an accident. I had (laughs) an app on my phone and I was just trying different things playing in the background. And I got this hip hop beat running and all of a sudden I'm dancing around my kitchen going, we treat the water, we treat the water right. We treat the water, we treat the water right. And I thought, that's catchy. (laughs) It's very catchy. (laughs) And so I kind of fleshed it out a little bit. And one day I heard my husband humming it (laughs) as he was in the kitchen. And I thought, oh, yeah, I have something. I need to put this out. (laughs) So it took less than a week to take this song from an idea to an actually recorded song, uh, recorded in one of my colleagues' offices in her cardboard sound booth. The best sound booth. (laughs) Yes, yes. And... Then, I don't know if anybody else has experienced something like this, but sometimes the greatest thing someone can tell you is no. And I was told that I couldn't release it. And that took me from, hey, this is kind of something fun, to something that I desperately had to do. No holds barred, one way or another, I was going to do this. (laughs) Why did they say that? I think it was just because it was so crazy that I I had written a rap about wastewater. That I mean, when you see it on paper, it is crazy that someone would do that. So I maybe they thought it was a joke. I don't know. (laughs) But I I ended up calling up some people that I knew that had influence and I was like, I have this song, it's really good. I need to put it out there. You have (laughs) to You have to convince them to let me release this. And we finally got the okay. And the amazing, fabulously talented John Gonzalez from the Northeast Ohio Regional Sewer District threw together a video for it, a music video, in less than 24 hours. And we got it up uh, on the website. It's also on my Twitter account if anybody needs to see it. You probably do. Yes, you do. Um, (laughs) So with all of that, 
if I hadn't won, it would have been devastating. <laughs> <laughs> so I submitted it to the uh, Water Environment Federation, which is a national organization. I won and I got a free trip to the Weftech conference for winning, which was incredible because I wasn't going to be able to go that year. My operations challenge team did not win a spot, so I wouldn't have gone otherwise. And then another plug here is for the Jammin' for Water organization. They are a fundraising opportunity that happens in conjunction with the, not in conjunction with, but near the Weftech conference. They are a fundraiser for water-related charities. They may end up giving away, you know, tens of thousands of dollars every year to charity. And it's such a cool event. They bring in musicians from all over the United States that also do wastewater. You wouldn't think that there was a whole market of that, but there is. There's so many people in, in our industry that are also guitar or bass or drummer or uh, they play the flute or there was a jazz oboe last year. So they invited me to come to that concert and perform live in front of all of the presidents and all of the CEOs and all of the directors. I think everyone was a little bit surprised that that was the song that had been selected. But, you know, as, as the song progressed, they were starting to, you know, tap their feet and get, get into it a little bit. So I, that was just a really neat experience for me that I didn't, again, I didn't really mean for it to happen, but sometimes you take opportunities when you get them and you live them to their fullest. Absolutely. That was a great story. Thank you for sharing. Have you got any final thoughts that you would like to share either about operations, careers, or supporting women in this water space? Well, I suppose maybe uh, one more thing that I did that I would highly recommend for anybody in any field, regardless of whether it's wastewater, um, if you're a woman or not. Um, having a guiding principle that, that you've developed over some time, I think is really, really important. So for me, what I've done, I am a huge Bill Nye fan. Like he changed my life. He was a great, great person that I always have wanted to emulate. And when he told his story of building the Bill Nye the Science Guy show, what he did was he developed what's called the rules of the road. And they're this, this manifesto of what it means to be Bill Nye the Science Guy and what that show was supposed to be about. And when I saw that he had put that together early in the project and always looked back to it, it was always included in, in the show, I wanted to do the same thing for myself. And perhaps we can post an actual photo of my rules of the road because they are a lovely handwritten monstrosity. But some of my rules of the road are to share information, always. No hoarding it, using it against people, or assuming people don't want it. That's not your call. Post signs, send emails, talk. Use at least three types of communication for the really, really important stuff. Number two, stay positive, relentlessly positive. It will make others calmer and happier, except the haters. It'll drive them crazy. So that's okay, too. Number three, admit mistakes. Everyone already knows. Just get it over with. Number four, walk the plant. So maybe this is a little more wastewater related, but... You can probably relate it to any field. Every day, no excuses. You can't be the expert if you aren't immersed in it. And who doesn't want to be immersed in wastewater? Uh, this is probably my most important guiding principle is that people are more important than the process. The process is more important than the equipment and the equipment is more important than your ego. And the last one is just because you're the expert doesn't make you right. 
that goes for your bosses too. So those were the rules of the road that I have laid down from the first day that I moved into management. And I feel like those are my guiding principles that make me an effective leader, hopefully, in uh, my organization. That is so great. Well, I would like to thank you for sharing some time with me today. This has been a great discussion. Thank you for enlightening us about the world of water treatment operations. Thank you. It was really fun. I'm so glad you were able to join me for this discussion with Kristen Wood. We discussed several books on this episode, including Multipliers by Liz Wiseman, Turn the Ship Around by David L. Marquette, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson and Joseph Grenny. So those are highly recommended by us if you want to check those out. And then like Kristen mentioned, you can find her on Twitter at sewer underscore chick, and it's C-H-I-C. The Empowering Women podcast is made possible by the Empowering Women in Industry organization. The organization is hosting their first conference in 2019 in Chicago. This one-day event will be September 26th at the Chicago Athletic Club, and it will be filled with keys to the next steps for your career goals and ambitions. We have an excellent lineup of powerhouse leaders who will be speaking. So if you're listening at the time of release, which is April, you still have a little bit of time to get the early bird pricing for the conference. So head over to empoweringwomeninindustry.com to register. And you can also find details about the speakers and the hotel there as well. Thank you again for joining me today. I'd like to ask if you are finding the Empowering Women podcast at all helpful or inspiring, please go to iTunes or wherever you download your podcast and leave us a positive review. These reviews mean a lot to me personally, but it also helps the show to rank and to be found by other listeners. If you have ideas for us or you'd like to get in touch, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter as Mel the Engineer, and you can email me at MelTheEngineer at gmail.com. That's all for now, so until next time. Thank you for joining us for an episode of the Empowering Women podcast with Mel the Engineer. If you find the Empowering Women podcast helpful, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. Our show is a partnership between Mel the Engineer and the Empowering Women in Industry organization. Learn more by visiting empoweringwomenpodcast.com.